Yeah, who has a question? And Gavin, do you mind uh, joining us on the stage? <laughs> Thanks. Okay, first question in the back. Oh, as Gavin said, your diversity after your watch was rising. But uh, consultants in Taiwan, they may put money into some association in local, uh, and the association might be owned by the consultants. So maybe the diversity can, can't mean some, um, can mean some rising. <laughs> And and I'm very surprised of Vasily. <laughs> they can spend money on restaurants or meals, something. So uh, I think uh, you, after you watch this thing, uh, you might also uh, careful of what happened in other countries. So like like us in Taiwan, they put money in association. Maybe. After you watch them, you, they will do something like this. Actually, I have a question for Gavin. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yes, so you said that the government changes its data all the time, so it happens to us, and how will you deal with that? What, what do you do uh, uh, instead of using the JSON structure? How can you... Uh, deal with it, yes, with that changes, because we have the same problem. So to answer the question on suppliers, um, sure, there can be, I guess one is the transparency of who the suppliers are, so understanding that, and then linking that through to the corporate records, so you can understand who is doing business with the government is very important. In the case of Ukraine, it's been thousands of new suppliers and actually they then have um, a lot of sort of uh, social media engagement on who the new suppliers are and encouraging people to bid. So it feels like there's a genuine competitive market there and there's been a measurable increase in the number of bids per contract. So there are more people bidding, which in turn has driven the price down, particularly as ProZorro runs reverse auctions. So you know every bid must be lower than the last one for routine goods and services. Um, now, that's one example of how open contracting can integrate into e-procurement systems. I think we'll be hearing from Iofema, who'll be talking about open contracting to track sort of um, uh, in Nigeria and looking at you know, just the very first understanding what is the marketplace, what does competition even begin to look like by collecting data on the market and then measuring it over time. So your point is a great one. I think it's a question of what's the measurable impact. If it's genuinely driving savings, then it feels like real competition. If it's not, if it's like um, uh, all clustered around the bid price, then actually you can take the open contracting data and analyze that as long as you're collecting the bidding information and look for, hold on, these aren't real bids. This is, uh, if you like, you know, um, pretend competition. So you, if you're genuinely using the data well, you can look at those kind of things. That makes sense. Um, and your question on how do you deal with perpetually updated data, we take a releases and records type approach to that. So, so you can uh, effectively, you know, a release is uh, the government saying, here's the overall database as we understand the point in time, but different people can amend the contracting records so that you, you track through the JSON when the record's been changed and who changed it at a different point in time, and then releases put together the definitive snapshot of who thinks they've got the last iterated change on that record. But the government tell you when it changed. Yeah, Brazil don't have that. But Brazil don't have that. Okay. They, they just change. Right, so, so yeah, that, that's the challenge. But at least with that, you can say, well, here's the last change I know about, as long as it's got some timestamping on there. So, yeah. so the release and records attempt to deal with that. Multiple different government departments do things at the point in time. And also, to be fair, you will have two records of a contract. Which one is true? You don't know, right? So therefore, you need to know that there's been effectively two separate records, and then you know, when yes. they were released is the important point of that information. Yes. So at least you're trying to compare. That, you know, there, there often, in some cases, is no single source of truth, which is why I think IFEMA is going to tell us about how they then go offline to then go and take that data and, and chase the government to find out what's happening. And that's the important piece. You know, the data starts the conversation, it doesn't end it. You then have yes, to use yes, the information. Yes, yes, we huh. use that too. 
Yes. Cool. Sorry, you have a question? Yes. <laughs> uh, are there any more questions from the audience? Yes, two. Hello. Hello. <laughs> um, I have a question about Rosie. Um, uh, based on your presentation, I was just, uh, I assume that the actual positives must be uh, high, relatively high in Brazil. So I was just wondering, can you give me a general idea on Rosie's performance, like um, the sensitivity? and specificity and probably a general idea on the classifier that you used because we're also uh, doing machine learning and the classifier you know is a really big challenge so i'm really interested maybe i can learn something thank can you yes. maybe so, let's take one more question okay. and then we can like answer both of them Hi, this is Phil Gavin. Um, I'm from South Africa, and um, I'm curious, when you're approaching open contracting, um, do you go through civil society? Do you approach the government directly? How do you deal with pushback? Um, I mean, there's vested interest in keeping it closed. How do you deal with that? Good question. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, so, Rosie is basically unsupervised machine learning, and we have all the classifiers that she has, we build ourselves based on the hypothesis that we analyzed. So, the idea is you take an, uh, a possible way that some expense might be suspicious, for instance, uh, closed companies, uh, they have, uh, each company in Brazil, they have an ID uh, that they use to give the receipt back uh, uh, once the service is done. And uh, the idea was, for instance, uh, that closed companies will give him, uh, receipts back. You can find the information whether the company is closed or not, when it was closed. So we cross-referenced the, the data of the when the receipt was uh, given and when the company closed. So the idea is you have a set of rules and we coded that into uh, into Python scripts using scikit-learn and, and things like that uh, to make the rules uh, based on what we have from the data, is, uh, is, is tailor-made uh, classifiers. Um, what else? I think, I think that the best thing that we have to say about that is that we focus on solving the problem, not the algorithm. So like we have traveling uh, classifier like if we have an expense in the middle of the country in the midday, uh, like you can have another in the midday in the south of the country. So we have a classifier for that. And we, we came with hypotheses and we try to solve them using code. It's not like we don't, we don't, pro we produce the code ourselves, but we don't try, we don't use it uh, as technology, you, we use to solve the problem. So I think that's the, the, the difference. Great, um, thanks. Yeah, maybe you should like uh, sit together after the session to like develop uh, Rosie the Robot for Taiwan. Um, a quick answer to the question from South Africa, please. And then we're going to listen to a project from Nigeria. Sure, so it, it can work in a number of different ways. It's not always government led. And what's been really interesting, I would say is, actually the most impactful kind of open contracting inter interventions aren't often government-led initially and then government picks up because it perceives the impact maybe to counter vested interests sometimes there's pushback and in fact uh, to sort of hand over to Ayafima, an interesting example from Budeshi in Nigeria which was kind of built by civil society and then used to show government the potential of what could be done and then use that to like talk about governmental change and Ukraine was similar it was actually sort of volunteers who were originally procuring humanitarian supplies for the war in the east who then said we could, you know, took that into public procurement. So it was like an outside hacker project that then went into government. And part of the narrative was, if we'd done this in government, it might have been killed at the start. So there's three different ways. There's government-led, where the government says, we need to change if we want more competition. We get that a lot in Europe. Um, there's where there's an existing e-procurement system and then open contracting scrapes the data out of that and starts sharing that through portals, which could be citizen-owned um, or they could be government-owned and shared, a bit like the city of Montreal does that through the government. 
uh, their local government, or it can be civil society led, scraping government data, analyzing, and using that. So and in Ukraine's case, it was where open contracting is the model and is the center to the procurement system. So there's kind of three different pillars there. Um, it's too early to tell what the exact impact is, but I'm kind of excited by perhaps the open contracting at the heart of government procurement and then the civil society led ones and the evidence there is so far they have got great stories to tell. The government sort of incremental change one takes a while and it depends on the government's ability to execute and then very importantly how much government brings civil society and users into the process. So we've seen some publications where they just kind of want to be transparent for transparency's sake and that hasn't led to great impacts. And when they actually know I want to engage business, I want to engage civil society and use this information to track procurement, then it's had a lot more impact. So Paraguay is a good example where that engagement has been baked in and has been impactful. Perfect. Thank you for the Q&A.